Who has taken microbiology at some point in their career? All right, sweet. Is that like a required class? Yeah. Sweet. You'd think I would know what the uh, prereqs are, but it's above my pay grade. Um, so I'm going to put these on Blackboard. I don't think I have them up there yet. But when I, as I'm going through some of these antibiotic classes, um, there's going to be some you know, bacteria names that I throw out there that if you're not familiar with, I have them listed kind of broken down by gram stain and um, whether or not it's rod, sphere, you know, all that stuff, cockeye, if you, for those of you who have taken micro, or I guess all of you. Um, and so I have a lot of them listed here in this table. Some of the anaerobes I have on this table and what you'll be kind of looking at. So like something that's like strictly an anaerobic um, microbe like um, B. frag right here at the bottom, um, that's going to be something that we'll talk about. Um, but if I mention any antibiotic that, or some microbe that you're not familiar with, we'll definitely, I'll explain it as we go. But I'm going to put these charts on here too just for your reference. And then if this is like, if it's been a long time since you've looked at micro stuff, it wouldn't hurt to also kind of just go back through, like you have access medicine, right? They have some like really basic micro stuff on there, like micro for medicine kind of thing um, to get yourself some context. But we'll go through it and uh, I'll answer questions as we go. All right, so this should all be familiar to you, but gram stains. So one of the first things we kind of talk about when we're looking at the, not just morphology, but also kind of trying to classify what type of um, microbe it is, would be the gram stain. I'm sure you guys have all done gram stains yourself if you had lab. Um, gram positive bacteria typically have that thick um, peptidoglycan wall and uh, when they stain on a gram stain, they come back as like this violet color um, because they the wall itself um, takes up that crystal violet stain that you use. And so they have this purplish, bluish color on the stain if you actually look at it under a microscope. Um, gram negative bacteria have a very thin wall and uh, they cannot take up that crystal violet. So they typically stain like a pink, reddish color. And then at this point too, you can also see the morphology and actually be able to tell if it's, you know, Staphylococcus, or if it's you know um, spheres like in clusters or strep, if it's in chains and all that fun stuff, um, rods. So if it's like a bacillus or one of those type of things, um, the morphology is obviously really important as well. Um, nowadays, it's not like you're going to draw a culture and then you're going to go sit in a micro lab and pull it out and try to identify. The, I mean, it's going to come back to you and say this is what it is. Um, but it's still important to know, okay, if this is gram positive, gram negative, like how you're kind of treating it when you're actually picking your pharmacotherapy options. Um, and then um, aerobes are obviously bacteria that are going to thrive in a presence of oxygen. Anaerobes are um, thriving in the absence of oxygen. We will spend a lot more time talking about um, aerobic bacteria, but or anaerobes we will mention as well. So when I say empiric therapy, um, Empiric therapy is referring to antibiotics that just basically cover a broad spectrum of pathogens, and we give empiric therapy, and this happens a lot of times inpatient because we don't know what the bacteria actually is, right? So it takes a little bit for that stuff to come back from the lab, um, and as time goes on, it'll get faster and faster, but we still, in some cases, it takes a little bit. Plus, we have to run um, the susceptibility reports and all that, which we're going to talk about in a second. But empiric therapy is going to cover all the potential bugs that could be causing this type of infection. So if I say like pneumonia, let's say, if it's you know pneumonia out in the community, uh, have you guys talked about pneumonia in ClinMed yet? You guys, I don't even know if you mentioned that yet. Um, so if you talk about pneumonia, you know we always think about the bacteria um, Streptococcus pneumoniae is kind of like what causes pneumonia, but there's a whole bunch of other bacteria that can cause it. Um, there's some gram negative, there's some gram positive, um, there's a lot. So we cover empirically, especially like with hospital acquired pneumonia, where it could be a couple different bugs that are pretty resistant and kind of nasty. Um, we'll use empiric therapy that will cover multiple drugs, and sometimes we use two agents to cover one type of bug in case one's resistant to that. And then as soon as we get our, our actual like cultures back and we know exactly what it is, then we'll de-escalate the empiric therapy and narrow it down because we don't want to keep them on a multiple drug regimen if we don't have to, but when we first start out, we're kind of shooting in the dark, so that's what we do. Um, an antibiogram, have you guys ever seen one of these in person? Where So most um, 
ho uh, all hospitals are going to have like their own susceptibility patterns um, presented on an antibiogram. Now these are going to be specific like to a period of time. They get updated, and they're also specific to that location. So like when I was in school, if I was down at the at MUSC like working in one of the ICUs, I had a different antibiogram than when I came here to Trident and was working on their internal medicine floor. Um, so even though it's in the same you know, Charleston city limits technically, it's completely different susceptibility patterns. So like well, they'll use some antibiotics here that they won't use at MUSC because they have more resistance rates down there. So don't think that just because you're familiar with one area, like if you go somewhere else, it could be completely different, even if it's in the same, you know, general location. Um, but it's gonna basically show the percentage of each organism's susceptibility to various antibiotics, uh, and that's gonna help you kind of selecting your empiric therapy for that, you know, area of that hospital. So a lot of times they have kind of like their protocols that they follow. So like if somebody comes in and they have, let's say you suspect it's hospital acquired pneumonia, they have their particular protocol that they follow and that's based on like the hospital pricing, what they get the drugs for, um, as well as the susceptibility and all that. So sometimes, you know, if it's a big, if it's a common enough disease state, it's, you don't have to put all that much thought into it. Um, they're going to have kind of what you need to start with in, originally. Um, but if it's something that you don't see a whole lot, you would want to pull the antibiogram and help make your decision for empiric therapy. So this is an example of one. Um, so like in this page, in this case, like E. coli, um, if it's outpatient, you know they have um, different. And this is all these different antibiotics. Um, the ones towards the top, like ESBL, is a type of resistance that we see. So in outpatient setting there's higher resistance, um, or excuse me, lower resistance than if I were to put someone in like an inpatient or ICU. And so if it's inpatient, it might change how I'm gonna treat that same disease state if, it, if I think E. coli is what's causing it because of these resistance rates, um, and then so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So when you get a culture and susceptibility uh, report back, Typically, they'll have the MIC on there, which is the uh, minimum inhibitory concentration. So that's the in, uh, minimum like drug level that you would have to have in the body in order to inhibit growth of the, of the microbe. We'll talk about how to actually use that in a second because that can get a little confusing if you're just looking at it face value. Um, one of the most important things, though, is the actual um, susceptibility part of the report and that's where it tells you the organism that's caused you know causing the infection and then it actually lists a group of antibiotics and tells you whether or not it's either susceptible so that means that the drug will work against the antibiotic um, intermediate which means that it may be effective but maybe not and then resistant means that the drug's unlikely to work we almost likely will, will not use that particular drug um, and so this is what one would look like. And so if we had, so Pseudomonas is a hospital acquired bug, it's something that can be um, pretty nasty and it can be resistant to a lot of different um, antibiotics and things like that. So if I get this back, it's gonna be resistant. Um, this doesn't have great coverage of it anyway, um, but that's, we definitely know this one's off the table. Um, and then as Trinam, Ceftazidine, these are ones that would be more commonly used, and so they are susceptible, and so we could pick from one of these two, um, or you know, vice versa, and some of the other ones as well. But what to look at when you're kind of figuring this out is one, you want to make sure it's susceptible first. If it is susceptible, then um, the MIC is not, so if I have an MIC, I mean inhibitory um, concentration, if I have one that's at four and one's at eight, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is better than this. What this is more focused on is, okay, let's say I'm going to use this particular drug. I know I need to get to this level in the blood um, and have, and that would affect my dosing of it. Now, if that person, if this, let's say this, this is not one of them, but let's say this drug caused renal impairment if I gave it a high enough dose. If I know that this is a high enough number where if I, in order to get to that particular dose, I might wreck the person's kidneys, I'm probably going to pick a different agent that doesn't have that risk or you know has a lower MIC or something like that. So it's using this is more like once you've picked the agent, how you kind of calculate your actual dosing and go from there. Um, but it's not compare like people get confused where they want to compare these head to head and that's not how it works. Um, and then I, the reason I put this table is as we kind of go through some of this, you're going to kind of see that some of these drugs even so meripenem. Um, 
isn't one that we, um, excuse me, actually meripenem is. Sometimes you'll see drugs in this report. I actually took them off to reduce, uh, get rid of confusion. I forgot. I changed it last year because first year was like, what the heck? You told us this didn't cover it. Every once in a while, you will see drugs that typically don't cover a certain bacteria, um, but they'll show up on the, on the report and it'll still say it's susceptible. So for whatever reason, it's, that it is taking that out. Um, so when I'm going through these lists of antibiotics and I say this covers this, that's like generally speaking. Um, so if I say like ceftriaxone covers pseudomonas, that means typically speaking, it's gonna cover pseudomonas. Um, there can be cases where it's resistant like here, um, or not ceftriaxone, ceftazidime rather, is, is one that typically covers pseudomonas. So if you see that and you're like, yeah, that would normally cover it. There are cases where it's, it's resistant and because it's developed some weird mutation. Um, but there's other cases where like this doesn't cover pseudomonas typically. Every once in a while you'll see it come across where it does say susceptible. You still would want to probably go with one of the agents that we always think about when we're thinking about coverage. And that'll make a lot more sense in a second when I start going through these slides. And then if you ever get like confused or unsure, you have the Sanford guide, right? It's your best friend. So make sure you use that until you are like an infectious disease expert. Does that make sense a little bit as far as how to use the susceptibility report? Looking for resistant or susceptible first off, and then narrowing it down from which agent you want to use based on patient parameters. So we want to, we want to use the antibiotic with the narrowest coverage. Once we actually have the report back, we know, you know what. Um, actual microbe we're actually going after, which pathogen. So I'll use this as an example again. So Piptazo has very, very broad spectrum coverage. It covers a lot of um, gram positive, gram negative, all of the above. So this as Trinam basically only covers gram negative bugs. And so if I know it's pseudomonas, it's both susceptible, both within reason to use. Um, unless it's like off formulary or something like that, like the hospital can't get it, this may be a better option to use in this case because it, it is more narrow coverage and you have less chance of like building up resistance to some other type of bug. Because what this can do is, let's say I give this to treat a gram-negative bug um, and then the person gets exposed to some kind of a staph with gram-positive bacteria. This could induce or start the process of inducing resistance, which we don't want to do. Um, so always use narrow coverage once we actually know what the pathogen is. Don't compare the MICs directly between each other. Um, using it for actual, once you select the agent you're going to use, then you use that to kind of base your dosing and all that on. Some things to kind of consider while you're picking a treatment would be obviously guideline recommendations, especially for uh, any kind of infection. Guideline recommendations are always very useful because you can kind of look up and see exactly what's recommended for treatment. Those get updated a lot. Um, and so as things change, as resistance rates change, um, the guidelines will change. So we kind of base that uh, first. Usually if you look at the guidelines, it'll give you a list of multiple agents that you could use. It may have a preferred agent, but then it'll have like alternatives. Um, and so at that point, you want to look at the drug site of action, like where that drug actually accumulates, um, patient-specific factors like their renal function, their hepatic function, um, what other drugs they're taking, and then obviously drug cost as well. You know, if I have a, there's an antibiotic that covers um, resistant staph, MRSA, um, that is like, I want to say like a couple thousand dollars, and like Bactrim or doxycycline that costs like ten dollars also covers it. So it might be more convenient to give a newer drug, but in some cases, not necessary. A lot of times, just because it's a new drug with antibiotics doesn't mean it's always like way better. So keep in mind, drug cost is something we tend to not always consider when we're in a clinic setting and we're getting a patient, but they leave, especially outpatient, they go to a pharmacy to go pick it up and they can't afford it, then hopefully they're calling you back to let you know, or they're, sometimes they're just going to go home and not do anything about it until it gets worse. So antibiotic resistance is something that is talked about quite a bit. Um, they put a bunch of scare stories out there that show like, oh, these antibiotics are changing and mutating, and we're, or these microbes rather are changing and mutating, and we're not going to be able to actually catch them, and they're going to kill us all. Um, maybe, but hopefully not. So antibiotic resistance, though, is a very real thing. Um, and I have a couple different examples here of th there's, there's a whole bunch of different 
genetic mutations that can happen that can cause different types of um, resistance. So the first one that you'll hear a lot, uh, you'll be very familiar with, is beta-lactamase. So certain bacteria, specifically gram-negative in this case, um, if, let's say, uh, let's talk about pneumonia. Um, so we used to use a drug that covered like, like um, something like amoxicillin, where you would get coverage of strep strains and you would get coverage of um, gram-negative strains that can cause pneumonia as well. Well, over time, the gram-negative uh, bugs started developing these beta-lactamase um, enzymes. And what that does is so, and we'll talk about this when we get into classes, but penicillin derivatives are going to be, have this like beta-lactam ring, like right at the center. And that's kind of what they use in order to disrupt the cell wall or what, however they're going to actually kill the bacteria. Um, so bacteria have this enzyme that they can produce now that actually disrupts that cell wall and breaks the antibiotic apart. And so it's completely useless. And so these beta-lactamase um, enzymes are becoming more prevalent. Um, they're being produced by more and more of these gram-negative bacteria, and it's causing resistance. So we're having to change how we actually, the drugs we use, and then what we're combining with those drugs to kind of overcome that uh, beta-lactamase. Um, ESBL is a term you'll see, which is ex um, extended spectrum beta-lactamase. So that's where like a large spectrum of antibiotics are disrupted by that beta-lactamase enzyme. So we have to really use like a specific type of agent. Um, AMP-C is just another type of, um, like a mutation on the chromosome that can cause uh, beta-lactamase to be overproduced and, and disrupt that, that beta-lactam ring. Then on the gram-positive side, so like when we hear MRSA or people call it MRSA, um, the reason why that's resistant is because, so when a, when a penicillin derivative, whether it's, we don't usually use plain penicillin anymore, but if we're using like amoxicillin or one of those, um, nafcillin, one of those newer agents, um, if it binds, when it binds to, in this case, staph, it's binding to something that we named um, conveniently the penicillin binding protein. So bacteria was like, okay, that's not cool. I'm just going to change my binding site now. And now the, the uh, antibiotic can't bind there anymore, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't actually break apart the cell wall. So there is... Um, a big issue with that, and then we have to use different drugs that are specifically targeting different things instead of the actual penicillin binding protein at that point. There's an upregulation of efflux pumps. So just like we have in our GI tract, like we were talking about um, peptidoglycan, um, p-glycoprotein in our GI tract where we have drugs that get absorbed and then effluxed right back out again into the GI tract, um, bacteria have the same thing. So they start just upregulating those efflux pumps and the ones that uptake these, these antibiotics that actually have to go internal into the actual cell itself just get pumped right back out, and they're useless at that point. And so that's becoming more prevalent. There's also um, a decreased expression. So one of the ways they actually get through the outer membrane of the bacteria is actually going through that porin channel. Um, so the bacteria just stop producing, or they decrease the expression of that porin channel, so there's less of them to actually get through that membrane. And so different things like that. And there's, there's a whole bunch. You could have pages and pages of different mutations that we see out there. Um, and these are constantly changing. And so things are becoming, the susceptibility is changing, things that we used to use all the time. Because we used them all the time, on, and probably in times we didn't have to use them, they're becoming, uh, these bacteria are getting smarter, so to speak. So antimicrobial stewardship. Has anybody ever heard that term before? So what that is, is these, um, it's a group that a hospital will set up. And this is kind of, I don't know exactly when, what year this kind of started, but I feel like it's fairly recent. Um, the antimicrobial stewardship like movement was to basically try to cut down on resistance. So it's where a group of like multi um, professionals, like multi types of, so usually it'll be like physicians, pharmacists, um, nurses, PAs, who, you know, will you know, be grouped together and they'll come up with, okay, based on the resistance patterns that we see in the hospital um, and what kind of like resistance we're already seeing, they'll put things on formulary in the hospital that you can use. They'll take things off. They'll make things that are like, um, you know, the, where you have to get like an ID consult to actually sign off on it before you can actually prescribe it. There's, there's different things that they'll do to kind of monitor that, but they're in charge of developing those antibiograms. Um, they're also there to kind of make the 
cost of the drugs, you know, make the cost effectiveness um, in the hospital kind of something that they're continually thinking about because a lot of the times these drugs uh, that come out, they're super expensive when they first get released and there's other ones that treat just as well. And so they'll take things off the you know, formulary so that you can't use them um, if it's going to cost the hospital a lot of money. So they kind of do multiple things, but the main reason why they started was because these resistance rates were going up. So to give you an example, um, E. coli has become very resistant, in, at least in the MUSD area, to um, a drug called ciprofloxacin, or Cipro is the brand name. And so I, I'd have to check and see if it's still like this, but I know like when I was in school, um, they basically in order to use Cipro in the hospital, you had to get an infectious disease consult and the infectious disease attending had to actually sign off that it was okay. So you had like very specific things that you could use it for, like if the person needed leech therapy, where they had like to get the blood flowing in the hands, they actually stick leeches all over them. Well, leeches have something called um, aeromonas, is a type of bacteria in their mouth and they can cause an infection, so they give Cipro prophylactically. It's not all the time that you're using leeches in the, th in the hospital setting, so they, that's like a special situation where they would use it. Um, and there's certain other things where they'll kind of allow you to use Cipro. But other than that, they basically cut it off so you can't use it and you have to use a different drug because we were the resistance rates were going up so much for E. coli. And it was used to be a simple bug to treat. Now it was becoming a, a big problem. I know the first time I ever saw leeches in the hospital, I always expected like, I don't know what I expected, but I expected them to be like in this fancy like scientific tank. They, I swear they're like in a freaking pickle jar that someone had just like <laughs> thrown in the corner of like the inpatient pharmacy. It's like, oh God, that's, those are just straight up leeches somebody found, I feel like. <laughs> All right, so another thing to kind of consider is some, some antibiotics are, are considered bacteriostatic and some are considered bacteriocidal. So bacteriostatic means that you're basically inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. So they're usually working on like protein synthesis or some aspect of, of the uh, growth process and the replication process of the bacteria. So you shut that off and the bacteria itself will die off as a result. Um, bacteriocidal are basically antibiotics that are going to kill the bacteria directly. They're, so they're actively like destroying the, the parent bacteria, if you will. Um, We'll look at a couple examples of that in a minute and like why that would actually matter. But because it's just because bactericidal is a direct killing agent doesn't always mean that that's like a better agent. There's certain situations where we do have to use bacteriostatic in some cases to shut down the, um, the production of some of these proteins and stuff like that. Um, and then another way we kind of look at it is whether or not it's concentration dependent or time dependent. So if a drug is considered concentration dependent, that means we basically, when we're dosing it, we want to maximize the concentration above that MIC. So I'll show you what that looks like mathematically in just in the next slide. But we want to think the maximizing the concentration above the MIC. So it means we want to get a big spike in our concentration and then allowing it to go again below the MIC. And then if we're going to give another dose, another big spike, and then it can go below the MIC after that. Time dependent means that basically we want to maximize the time above the MIC. So it's not so much of a high concentration or a high dose. It's more so that just like if, even if it's barely over that MIC, as long as it stays above the MIC, that's where we want it. So mathematically speaking, so concentration dependence up here, time dependence down here. Um, this is some drugs that kind of behave uh, with a little bit of both. And so we're not going to worry about that as much right now. Um, but I want you to think concentration dependent. Um, our goal is to give a really high, so here's our MIC, right? Um, this is our concentration, this is time. And so we want to give this big high dose this to C max, max concentration, um, and then allow it to come through and see how it actually dips below the MIC. So when it dips below, that's actually to decrease toxicity. So if I give a really high level of this, immunoglycosides, for instance, can wreck your kidneys if you allow it to stay up here. Um, so they'll work fast to kill off the, the bacteria, but we need the, the, the concentration to come down below the MIC as quick as possible to decrease the toxicity or the chances of toxicity. So what I have here, like the examples that I have here are the ones that I want you to know. You don't have to know the ones in the middle at this point. So as a class, I want you to know aminoglycosides, 
quinolones, when you see quinolones, that's going to be fluoroquinolones is a longer name for that, and then daptomycin. So those three, these are two groups, and this is a standalone group that has one antibiotic in it. So these three um, are concentration dependent, and if you were going to try to improve uh, the effectiveness of this, then you would want to give a larger dose, um, and then you could use a uh, longer interval if you wanted to, but um, the large dose is the big one, increasing that max, that C max. And then if it's a time dependent, the beta lactams, so penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems are the three groups that fall into beta lactams. So if you see any an agent that falls into any one of those agents or those classes, it's a beta lactam. And we know that if we're going to give a little bit better um, MIC coverage, we're going to do shorter dosing interval. So that means that I'm dosing more frequently so that I'm not allowing uh, the like I'm not allowing the concentration to go that high. I don't have to give a very big dose, but I'm constantly keeping that steady uh, that concentration above that MIC. The other option is to do like a continuous infusion, which they do sometimes, where they'll give just enough to keep it above the line and then just let it kind of go plateau across the line like that. And again, here, longer interval, that means that I'm dosing less frequently, which gives this more time to fall below the MIC, go for a little bit before I give my next dose that shoots it back up again. So again, for this particular thing, what I want you to know which, which drugs in particular on here are concentration dependent, and then if you were going to adjust dosing or what your strategy would be for dosing on just the top and bottom here. Don't worry about area into the curve and MIC ratios at this point. There's a lot of different things we can do with that. What? I said consult farm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's more, more math that goes into those. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that stuff before we jump into actual classes? All good? All right, so beta lactams. So these are time dependent. The mechanism of action for all of the beta lactams, so again, it's penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems, um, is going to be they inhibit that penicillin binding protein. And that protein is responsible for that cross-linking that forms that thick peptidoglycan wall. And so if we inhibit that process, that's not able to actually cause that cross-linking, which kind of um, reinforces that wall, the wall breaks apart, bacteria dies. They all have this basic structure, though, um, where they have a beta-lactam ring at the center. Um, and then as they get more advanced, the newer agents have more elaborate ring structures like this, but all the kind of the same concept. So um, natural penicillins, to kind of start off with, these are going to cover like our very limited um, spectrum. So at this point, basically what we think about is it covers streptococci and enterococci, um, not staph. So certain things like certain like strep infections, like strep throat, we can still use penicillins or penicillin derivatives like amoxicillin and still get some results. Um, the other, th typically speaking, penicillin is not something that we use all that much anymore because we can just use amoxicillin instead. Penicillin, though, is, is taken every six hours if you're giving it uh, orally, and so it's just not as convenient. So usually the only time I'll see people that are taking penicillin, like plain penicillin, is from a dentist for some reason. A lot of them like penicillin. Um, and then injectable IM penicillin. Anybody have any idea what that's for? It's a super fun disease state. Syphilis. Um, so it's, it's one of the main things that we treat uh, syphilis with even today. So we give like these huge doses of um, penicillin G, which is an IM shot. And uh, it's one of those things that's, it's one of the, the, the best ways that we can treat syphilis to the point where even if somebody is allergic to penicillin, we still in a lot of cases will try to hope for the best and give them penicillin anyway. And um, in some cases, it's happened on errands. I think first couple days in rotation, we had a big debate on whether or not we were going to give this person syphilis um, IM penicillin. And I was like, I was voting for the whole, whole epinephrine and wait, the wait and pray. Um, but we did a different thing. 
Amoxicillin um, is an oral agent that we use. You know, oral, obviously, liquid capsules, all of the above, came, it's available. Um, ampicillin, there is an oral formulation of ampicillin. Um, it's very rarely used. It's got really bad bioavailability, so it's much better to give it IV. And so you'll usually only use ampicillin like in a uh, inpatient setting. If you're going to use kind of a more mellow antibiotic, you can still use ampicillin in the hospital setting. If you're outpatient, you're almost never going to see ampicillin. It's going to be amoxicillin, but they're the same, same class, same coverage, um, just different bioavailabilities. And then we got a little bit more fancy with how we made our, our penicillin derivatives. So we came out with the anti-staphylococcus penicillins. So the ones that we have available still, nafcillin, oxicillin, dicloxacillin. Um, these are going to actually cover strep and uh, staph. Typically, these are saved when you need staph coverage. So the way I kind of remember this is if you have, if it's strep, which is going to be more of like your respiratory infections, um, you know, sinusitis type things, I'm thinking more of strep. If it's skin infection, soft tissue infection, I'm thinking more staph, typically speaking. So if it's staph, it's susceptible. And notice I have this right here instead of MRSA. So this is methicillin susceptible staph aureus is what that stands for. When you see MRSA, it's methicillin resistant staph aureus. So this is not going to work if you have resistant staph. So MRSA, you don't give one of these or the staph's not going to get any better. Um, no gram, cover, gram negative coverage. Um, enterococcus is not covered as well like the older agents were. So I typically think, literally, if I see one of these three, I'm thinking staph is an easy way to remember it. Very r rarely would you give one of these um, if the patient's having like a strep infection. It's just you don't have to give something like that. And then we start having all this issue with beta-lactamase enzyme production, which was breaking apart um, the actual beta-lactam ring, which is why we couldn't use it for gram-negative bugs. Because remember, beta-lactamase is only seen in gram-negative. And so what they ended up doing is they would combine the penicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So you guys have all seen Augmentin before at some point. So Augmentin is just amoxicillin plus clavulonic acid, which is the beta-lactamase inhibitor. So now we have these penicillins that actually can treat gram-negative bugs again because of that beta-lactamase inhibitor built into it. Much more broad spectrum, still going to have the same coverage as far as the staph and strep, um, but you're also going to get all the gram-negative coverage. And then the one that's the kind of the heaviest hitter on this list here is Zosin Piptazo. Um, it's active against Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas is one you'll keep seeing me mention because it's a very like resistant bug that we see in the hospital setting. And so I want you to kind of be aware of which ones cover Pseudomonas, but I'll point them out specifically. So Piptazo is the one that covers Pseudomonas. The other ones do not. Um, let's say a person has like never been treated for some kind of like a very mild sinus infection. Um, amoxicillin most likely would work. Um, a lot of times they'll still go with the amoxicillin clavulonic acid because they're just hoping that it, it's more effective. It's still better, and you'll see when we get to like the HENT stuff, it's still better in most cases just to give the more limited agent because one, this causes horrible diarrhea, and two, um, we're giving a very broad spectrum antibiotic when we don't need to. So remember, always thinking like narrow if possible. If something doesn't work, you're not sure what the bug could be, it could be a whole slew of different things, then go broad spectrum and do the augmentin. Make sense? Adverse effects, um, GI upset, diarrhea potentially. Um, most people that say they're allergic to penicillins, um, there are definitely, it's very common allergy. Uh, a lot of them though have not had penicillin since they were babies. Um, and so if you have an allergy to penicillin as a baby, as an adult, it's most likely, I shouldn't say most likely, there's a good chance that it could kind of be, your body could get over it and take care of it. Um, that being said, if it is an allergy still that happens when you take penicillin, it's usually a rash. Um, very rarely are we going to see like true like anaphylaxis with a penicillin. So if you see penicillin allergy, I don't want you to like panic or anything like that. I mean, it's most likely going to be pretty mild. Um, in some cases, it can increase LFTs. It's very rare. Um, liver function tests, they're not very hepatotoxic, but it is something to kind of consider. Um, renal function, really the, the only time I want you to kind of pay attention to this is if like you were giving high doses of amoxicillin and the person's creatinine clearance was less than 30. 
Um, and so basically we would just want to stick to like the 500 milligram strength of amoxicillin instead of the 875. So we'd probably have to give it more frequently throughout the day to get the same dose, but we don't want that same concentration to kind of be, have to be filtered to the kidneys because th that may cause some problems. And then nafcillin is a vesicant, so um, cause extravasation. That's where if it gets out of the actual blood vessel, because you're giving that one IV, it gets out of the blood vessel, um, it can cause uh, tissue breakdown and stuff in the surrounding area. So you'd want to be careful with that one. Any questions about penicillin or penicillin derivatives? All right, cephalosporins. So this is the next, these are still beta-lactams. So these are all, again, remember, same, same overarching class. So the subclass, you have the penicillin derivatives, and the next came out, um, the next to come out was the cephalosporins. And then these are broken down into multiple generations. And so this is gonna take, unfortunately, just some memorization on y'all's part. Um, First generation cephalosporins is going to be the one I want you to really pay attention to. The two that you would most likely see would be Keflex, cephalexin, which is the oral agent. Um, Cefazolin is the IVIM. It also has an oral agent as well. Um, but these two are going to be the most common first generation cephalosporins that you would see today. And they have pretty decent um, gram positive coverage, so strep, staph. Um, gram negative coverage is really limited. So the beta lactamase inhibitors, the AMPC, some of those other resistance patterns that we see that causes that beta lactamase activity, still same concept. This has a very similar structure to a regular penicillin. And so you would get the same issue where it would break apart that ring and it wouldn't be able to work anymore. And so when you think of first generations, like if you see Keflex, you're thinking more of staph infection. So like a very mild skin infection, something like that. Now our second generation gets a little bit more into the, a little bit more broad spectrum to where typically speaking, we would see um, this more so in like if we are worried about gram negative bugs. So for instance, cefiroxime is one that we use in like different types of sinus infections, respiratory infections, things like that, because it covers strep, where if we're worried about like strep pneumo, um, as well as some of these other common gram-negative bugs. So Haemophilus, um, you'll see abbreviated H flu. That's one that can cause like different types of respiratory infections, pneumonia, things like that. Um, Proteus is another one that's pretty common. Klebsiella can cause pneumonia. Um, e. coli, I'm sure you've heard of that before. Um, but that's, it's a little bit more broad spectrum, but again, you're thinking more like on the gram-negative side of things um, than gram-positive. So just kind of think, a little bit more broad spectrum. The one I want you to pay attention to are cefiroxime and cefprozil. Those are the two that you would most likely see if you're going to see one of these agents. And by the way, there's a ton of drugs in these, each of these generations that are not listed. So just so you're aware, if you see a, a cephalosporin and you're like, what the heck is that? You can look it up and it'll tell you the generation. And from there, you can kind of assume where, it, where its coverage is. But I wanted to make this as simple as possible. So I tried to narrow it down as best I could but there's definitely a lot of drugs in each of these generations. I printed it one time, it was like 30 or 40 different drugs just in the cephalosporin class, so I figured you guys didn't want to memorize all those. All right, third generation, yay. Top one, um, I want, it's got very similar coverage as the second generation, so you can almost kind of like put those two together in your heads as far as the coverage. Um, Ceftonir and ceftriaxone are the, very, the two most common ones that you'll see. So these are gonna have pretty decent coverage of like common gram-negative bugs as well as like staph and strep, things like that. So like ceftonir you'll see sometimes in um, like sinus type infections or um, sometimes they even use it in like off-label like a pneumonia and things like that. Where the breakdown happens is the the group two of the third generation. Ceftazidime is the only third generation and really the only one that we've covered up until now that has pseudomonas coverage. I, this is like super stupid, something I'm not supposed to be promoting at CSU, but the way I always remember this when I was in school, because I was in school like Mike Jones, like the rapper was a little bit bigger. He used to have that song, like I need a dime, top of the line, blah, blah, blah. Everybody, any rap fans? No? Um, I, so I used to think of dime being like the best, and so it would cover, um, 
Pseudomonas, it's got the best coverage out of all the cephalosporins up to this point. Um, then one of the two, or the two newer drugs they have on the market now are ceftazidime with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So avabactam was added to ceftazidime. And then ceftolazone is uh, a drug that is also in combination with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, both of them will cover pseudomonas as well. These two right here are very expensive, and you most likely aren't going to see these too often in a hospital setting. So I want you to see, though, if you see ceftazidime, know that it covers pseudomonas. All the rest of them do not. Fourth generation, um, I want you to kind of be aware that, again, it's broad spectrum, but the big ones I want you to pay attention to are these last three. So it does have pseudomonas coverage as well. Acinobacter and Citrobacter are two potentially really nasty bugs. Um, they can cause like hospital acquired infections and uh, there's a lot of cases where people have died as soon as they get infected with this because they didn't have uh, antibiotics that could fight it off. So cefepime, this is one that I saw a lot at MUSC use like in the surgical and trauma ICU, stuff like that. Um, they'll use cefepime. Um, and so think Broad spectrum, but also like covering like the actual like really nasty what they call nosocomial pathogens. So, what two main cephalosporins cover Pseudomonas? Ceftazidime and cefepime. So, if I were to ask that as a question, if I say, hey, which one, of these, which one of these drugs does not cover pseudomonas? If I had ceftazidime and then some other ones we're going to talk about, and then I'll have one that clearly doesn't. So I want you to be able to, that's one thing when you're kind of memorizing all these, I do want you to pay attention to which one has pseudomonas coverage and which do not, because that's a very common, like, boards type question. They love that pseudomonas coverage thing. It's real, real popular. Um, and this is a fairly new agent. Um, Ceftaroline that they consider it a fifth generation is kind of like they just decided to call it that. And basically, um, it has MRSA coverage. So it's the only one that covers resistant staph. Mm hmm. So that's a multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. So there's lots of times where, remember how I said it, we typically will have, we know that typically speaking this drug will cover pseudomonas, but then we get the culture and sensitivity report back and it'll say resistant in some cases. That's because that pseudomonas is now mutated and it's even more resistant than just regular pseudomonas. And so that's where the, the reason why they end up taking ceftazidime and adding even more um, bang for your buck to it, and they added the beta-lactamase inhibitor, so it's even stronger of an antibiotic, and so it's used in, in pseudomonas infections that are already resistant to very common things that we would use to treat it. Basically, it's basically these two would be multi, and all it is is the uh, adding the beta-lactamase inhibitor. That's what makes it multi-drug resistant, effective or effective against multi-drug resistant. So first generation, we're thinking what? Gram positive or gram negative? Positive. Second generation and third generation, we're thinking more so broad spectrum, but mostly gram negative, and then specifically ceftazidime, um, pseudomonas. Fourth generation, cefepime, we're thinking broad spectrum, including pseudomonas, acinobacter, citrobacter, those three bugs, and then fifth generation's MRSA. That's kind of how I want you to memorize that makes sense because again if you try to memorize oh each one this one covers Haemophilus and proteus and eco like they almost it's going to be impossible like not impossible if you have a great memory go for it but at this point in your careers you'll have the rest of it covered the more you use these the more you see them but that's just kind of a down and dirty way of just memorizing what you need to know the rest of it you can always look up quickly if you needed to All right, so just some kind of like points to make sure you're aware of um, with cephalosporins um, in particular. So the actual agents, cefiroxime and ceftonir, um, those need to be separated um, from antacids or 
um, by two hours. And if the person is using like H2 blockers, which is like your Pepsid or your Zantac, um, or any kind of a proton pump inhibitor, so Omeprazole, Nexium, any of those, um, you have to, you don't really want to use those two agents. So they need more of an acidic environment to be absorbed, and that's specific for those two. Um, adverse effects, that's kind of common, same as the penicillins. Um, so GI upsets, the really the, going to be the one that you see the most of. Now, this is something that comes up all the time. If somebody is allergic to penicillin, are they going to be allergic then to a cephalosporin? And the textbook answer is always watch. If somebody's you know allergic to one, then you know you could definitely be allergic to the other. Yes, you could be, but it's if you actually look at statistically speaking, it's less than 10% like across the board. And realistically, that's actually probably a lot lower. Um, some, some studies will even say it's like less than 1%. So if somebody has a, a penicillin allergy, they've had amoxicillin, let's say they had a real bad rash, you want to use Omnicef in them because you need that coverage of those, you know, for the sinus infection or whatever it is. I mean, as long as it was a rash, tell them to take it. If they have a rash, take Benadryl and call you and you can switch the antibiotic out. Um, if it's anaphylaxis, something like that, you definitely want to be a little bit more cautious, but know that you can, in most cases, safely prescribe that. And I'll show you a, a breakdown in just a second of some of the chemistry going on. Um, ceftriaxone is like kind of unique in that if you give it in a neonate, um, it can actually cause biliary sludging. That is like a, like a very typical board question that they'll ask. So if you're looking at like, um, like meningitis, let's say, after like a month old, then they will start using the ceftriaxone as like one of the drugs that, to, of the combo that treats meningitis. Up to that point though, they won't use it because of this biliary sludging condition. That was actually a question on my boards when I was getting licensed. And um, I've seen it on like a bunch of practice, like pants exams and things like that. So that's like the only cephalosporin that causes it, really the only beta-lactam that causes it. And so it's something to keep in mind. All right, this real quick is just a, uh, to, this is from up to date, and this was, they had a, a, a whole article that somebody wrote on the cross reactions if you're allergic to penicillins. And basically what it breaks down to is, even in, if it's a severe reaction that you get to a penicillin, it's based on like the, the side chains or the R group um, that's coming off that beta-lactam ring. And so Basically, the ones that have identical side chains are the ones that are going to have the, the most likely chance of being resistant. So if the person is allergic to amoxicillin, cefprozole is the only one that I said to know off that list I gave you. You just wouldn't want to give cefprozole. The odds of you giving cefprozole are pretty limited anyway, but just if you happen to pick that one, um, that would be the one that would most likely cause a cross-reaction. Ampicillin, again, you're probably not going to be using that anywhere except the inpatient. Um, and then cephalexin. Um, Cephalor is the other one that I had listed on the slides. Those two have the same identical side chains. This is going to be used outpatient. This is going to be used inpatient. So again, like the uh, if you were trying to discharge somebody, they had an allergic reaction to ampicillin, you probably don't want to give them cephalexin on the way out the door. But it's not. They kind of just if you like run a drug drug interaction check on a allergy versus a drug, it'll come back as cross sensitive on like a regular app or something like that. This is where you have to clinically make the decision of whether you're going to override the app saying that it's you know a problem um, or a computer system or whatever you're using. So this is where you the information's coming from. That if it's not one of those agents, you're most likely going to be perfectly fine. So the way I do it in my own head is basically if it wasn't anaphylaxis, I don't worry about it too much. <coughs> All right. Um, carbapenems, these are the third and last class of that beta-lactam umbrella. What time is it? Anybody know? Um, all right, so carbapenems. We have dorapenem, imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem. Um, these are considered very broad spectrum. These are going to be used and typically reserved for multi-drug resistant gram-negative infections. So when you see ESBLs, um, you know, that's what it comes back as. It's going to be a gram-negative infection with ex extended spectrum beta-lactamase. That means even if you give a beta-lactamase inhibitor, a lot of times it'll still break through that and you won't be able to use it. So they have to use carbapenems. The problem is these are IV agents. So like, for instance, we had a patient that came in 
had uh, an E. coli UTI. It was a male had a UTI that was caused by E. coli. We they tried they gave him a normal regimen of um, nitrofurantoin or something like that. Patient came back, symptoms were worse. They gave him something else, sent him home. And again, typically outpatient UTI is very easily to treat. You don't want to kind of run a susceptibility report. After the third time he came back, though, they did did it came back. So they brought it to me. They're like, well, what do we do? Because they were out of options with antibiotics. They showed it to the susceptibility report, and it was literally just down the whole column, resistant, 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 all the way down. We were like, oh, shoot. Someone's going to MUSA. And so that's, that was literally the only option we had was to send him and admit him to the hospital so that he could get IV antibiotics because that was the last thing he could treat his UTI. So in cases that we, we ended up, the only thing it was uh, susceptible to was um, meripenem. And so we had to, he had to go get IV antibiotics for a few days and get rid of it. But that's, you know, what we would kind of think about. So um, they all have pseudomonas coverage except erdipenem. That is also a super common, like, boards-type question, is which drug doesn't have pseudomonas coverage, and they'll have erdipenem listed on there. So we always think of carbapenems as being, like, very useful in these resistance bugs. Erdipenem does not have pseudomonas coverage. They also don't cover things like atypical pathogens, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, that's like uh, your chlamydia, not, not chlamydia like the STI, but chlamydia like chlamydia pneumonia. So it's a type of um, chlamydia strain that can cause pneumonia. Um, mycoplasm, uh, legionella, things like that. They're considered atypical. They don't really fit in any specific group, so we have to use very like specific regimens that co they'll cover those. And then MRSA, um, it doesn't typically cover. Um, and then VRE is vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. Um, when we get to vancomycin, we'll talk about that. But it's just a, another resistant that can cause um, a lot of problems that we, if we run into that particular strain. So carbapenems, one of the things I want you to consider is they can lower your seizure threshold. So if you have, and it's something that we don't worry about a lot unless we're using real high doses or if the person has like a history of seizures, you know, they, they're on seizure medication. Um, in particular, valproic acid is a seizure medication. Um, it can also be called Dibalproex is the other name for it or Depakote's the brand name. Um, this is a drug that's very commonly used, not just in seizures now, but they also use it as a mood stabilizer and things like bipolar disorder. And so if a patient comes in on valproic acid and you give them a carbapenem, you could decrease the actual concentrations of valproic acid in their system, and then they could end up having a seizure while they're inpatient. Then you got a whole other slew of problems you got to deal with. Um, but all, ultimately, I want you to kind of, anytime you think carbapenems, think, patients that are at risk for seizures or that are on multiple drugs that could potentially lower your seizure threshold. We'll get into a lot of that as we kind of go throughout the curriculum. But if you see drugs that can do that, I want you to kind of use this with a lot of caution and be aware that this could cause a person to actually have a seizure. Um, other than that, um, same kind of adverse effects to begin with as far as the other beta-lactams, um, except uh, patients with impaired renal function, and it's really the imipenem. Um, we have to watch out for, we would want to at least dose adjust. And that's where, unless you deal with these drugs all the time, you're not, I don't expect you to have that memorized as far as what to dose adjust to. Um, so you would Lexicomp or Stanford guide that and, and go from there. Cross sensitivity is the same thing as the cephalosporins. Um, if you have a penicillin allergy, the odds of you being allergic to a carbapenem are really small. Um, I would only really use caution in patients that had like anaphylaxis type of thing. Um, another thing you'll commonly see these used for is like diabetic foot infections. So when patients end up having their um, like limbs or toes or things like amputated from like uncontrolled diabetes, it's it, a lot of times it starts in the feet and they get an infection. Um, their neutrophils are kind of like frozen in place because of the high blood sugar. They can't migrate to the site of infection to start taking care of it. And they end up getting these like really bad infections. And a lot of times they don't even know it's happening um, because they've lost feeling in their feet and things like that. And so we'll use carbapenems to eradicate that um, inpatient. Saw a patient one time who, uh, um, did a foot exam on, and uh, she had a nail in her foot. Didn't know it. Yeah. So, if you ever hear, when we get to the diabetes section, we'll talk about, like, foot exams and stuff, and that always just kind of seems like, 
like a random thing. So that's the first thing to go with that neuropathy where you lose feeling. She literally had a huge stinking nail all the way through her foot and didn't even know it. So it's either really bad diabetes or she's a superhero and she wasn't aware. <laughs> all right, so beta-lactams, penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, all three of those fall into that group. Does that make sense? I had a lot of confusion with that last year. We're like, well, what's a beta-lactam and what's a penicillin? Beta-lactam is the overarching term, and from there we go, and then we'll break down individual agents from there. So this is a, a separate class, so monobactam. The only agent in this class is astreonam. Um, it does have a very similar like, mechanism of action as penicillin. Um, it's going to inhibit the cell wall from being able to synthesize, so it's, you get that... You, uh, disruption, that cross-linking, and the cell wall just it breaks apart and the bacteria dies. Um, basically, the coverage for this is gram-negative bugs, so including Pseudomonas. No gram-positive coverage at all, so it's only going to cover our gram-negative bugs, and it's going to be um, really Pseudomonas is the one that I typically think of um, when I'm thinking of s -M. So what they'll do is if a patient needs to be on a drug or two drugs, let's say, that cover um, pseudomonas, like empirically kind of thing. They'll use one, and then if the, the drug that they normally use, like let's say um, levofloxacin, levofloxacin is a uh, fluoroquinolone that we're going to talk about. That's another drug that they'll typically use inpatient to kind of empirically cover if they're worried about um, pseudomonas. So they'll do like cefepime plus levoquin or levofloxacin. Well, if the person can't take levofloxacin for whatever reason, you could potentially use estreonam there as an alternative, and it would cover the same thing. So only gram negative. So if I ever have a thing where it's like, which is going to cover staph and astreonam is one of the answers, don't pick it. Cool? Only gram negative. Um, can be used with a penicillin allergy regardless of the severity. There's no cross sensitivity there, even though they sound like they're similar classes. It's a completely different structure. Um, and this is available in multi um, formulations, specifically IV. And there's also a, an inhaled formulation that they have available now for cystic fibrosis. Um, adverse effects, very similar to penicillin. So think GI upset, maybe potentially LFTs, but that's very rare. So I want you to basically know with astreonam, you're covering your gram-negative drugs only. Um, and it can be used with, even with an anaphylaxis reaction to penicillin. All right, aminoglycosides. Um, these are drugs you've probably, at least a couple of them, seen before. They come in all kinds of formulations. Um, and there's other ones, too, like there's one called um, streptomycin. There's several others that we didn't really talk about. These are the three most common. Gentamicin, tobramycin, those are available. I mean, IV, IM, they're available as an ophthalmic solution, sort of like for eye infections. Um, and the mechanism of action here is basically breaking up that protein synthesis. So they work on something called the uh, 30S ribosomal subunit which is kind of what is in charge of like piecing all those amino acids together to make a protein, disrupts that process, and you uh, slowly just inhibit the growth over time. These are concentration dependent, so all the beta-lactams um, were all going to be more time dependent. So this is a concentration dependent where you would want to give a really high dose to maximize that um, concentration above the MIC, and then you can kind of separate out the um, dosing interval so that you don't cause any kind of issues like with the kidneys and things like that. Um, this is something that something called post-antibiotic effect comes into play. So even when you get below the MIC with one of the aminoglycosides, you actually still get some sort of suppression of that bacterial growth. You get like, it's like an after effect of the drug. Even though technically speaking, mathematically speaking, it's below that MIC, you're still getting some antimicrobial effect and you're disrupting that protein synthesis. So again, that's why we can kind of s separate out the dosing and to try to avoid like any kind of toxicities. Um, once we give a real high dose, we're still gonna get some effect as it comes down and even when it goes into that trough below the MIC. This is something I made for Instagram a while ago to show what that ribosomal subunit looks like. So that's for you if you really want it. All right, aminoglycosides um, are going to cover mostly your gram-negative bugs. So again, just like astreonam, you're thinking gram-negative, um, including pseudomonas. 
Now, there are cases where you'll see things like gentamicin used in gram-positive infections. Um, so there's typically, you'll see this in like um, enterococcal endocarditis, where you'll see gentamicin, even though it doesn't actually have any activity by itself against the enterococcus, um, it, it has like this synergistic effect when you add it on to the normal regimen of gram-positive antibiotics. Um, and then the other um, area that it will help with is atypical bacteria. So if you do have Legionella, Chlamydia, Mycoplasma, and again, this is not Chlamydia like we think of Chlamydia, Chlamydia, like, you know, STI. This is like Chlamydia pneumonia, um, a di different, different bug. Um, so atypical bacteria, uh, it will have coverage over that. So one question I may ask is, okay, if you have a patient that comes in with a uh, um, Legionella infection or atypical infection, which antibiotic is going to be able to treat it? And I might list, you know, penicillin, something, you know, that something that's not going to have it. And then you would look for the aminoglycosides or a couple of the others we're about, they're going to talk about probably next time. Um, but aminoglycosides are one of them. Now, black box warning, and this is why we want to let the dose kind of fall below that MIC to get that concentration kind of low is because the black box warning on these is nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. <coughs> and there's even cases of respiratory paralysis. So we do not want to give high doses of these frequently because then that dose stays real high and you could destroy someone's kidneys with this drug. So especially if you're using it in combination with other drugs, they potentially can be nephrotoxic. Um, there's definitely cases where they've cause some real real damage in patients. Um, and you also don't want to take away their hearing either with those high doses. So the ototoxicity is also another big one. So anytime you see, and this is another common like board type question, whenever you see uh, which antibiotic are we worried about with nephro and ototoxicity, it's always going to be the aminoglycoside you're looking for. Amicacin, gentamicin, tobramycin. And anything that has to do with some sort of a inner ear, tympanic membrane type thing, so vestibular toxicity, um, disruption of balance, all that stuff is all going to be typically caused from aminoglycosides if it's drug related. So monitoring. Now this is where, um, again, where Aaron was joking earlier about consult farm. This is usually where the farms and PAs will be working closely together. So they will draw a trough level, which means right before you give the fourth dose, they draw a level because that should be your trough to show how low the dose got. And then they will do a, a peak 30 minutes after the infusion. They can use those numbers, and it's typically the PharmDs that will do this. They use those numbers, they do some math, and can figure out whether or not we need to adjust the dose or, you know, it's good to go. Um, sometimes you'll draw the dose and be like, oh, crap, um, and have to fix the infusion rate and the, and the dose itself and all that. Um, so they do monitor this very closely, and that's because of the toxicity. Obviously, if the person already has renal impairment, we have to dose adjust. And then uh, if the patient is pregnant, you want to stay away from these, these drugs. Um, and then amicacin has, technically speaking, the broadest spectrum of activity, although for where you guys are at, I just want you kind of thinking as a whole, gram-negative, um, pseudomonas coverage, atypical coverage, and then synergy if you add it for something like enterococcus. You guys want to try to get through one more class, or is that enough for today? I'll let y'all pick. We'll save it. I feel like that's a lot. All right, any questions? Easy, right? So this is one of those weird sections where I'm not big on like just straight memorization, but there's not a whole lot of ways around this antibiotic stuff. Once you get it, then um, it'll make sense once you look at certain disease states because you'll have like the bugs and drugs piece of it already memorized. So there'll be less memorization down the road when we get into like the um, ENT, HENT stuff and all that because you'll know what, what kind of bugs typically cause those type of infections and then so you'll know which antibiotics to use. So there'll be a lot less memorization down the road with it when you actually apply these. But the drugs and bugs part where which drug treats which bug is just there's no getting around that. Everybody hates it. I hated it. I remember sitting in school being like, well, I'm done. I, was, I gave it a shot. <laughs> All right, y'all. I'll stick around for a minute if you have questions.
Thanks.